Throughout the early 1800s, railroad engineers were on a quest to find a way to connect the American city of Boston with the districts of New York. In 1851, after considerable pre-work, the massive undertaking commenced, but it required a variety of sub-projects and architectural features for successful facilitation. Key among these constructions was the requirement for a tunnel that stretched five miles directly underneath the Hoosack mountain chain, running parallel to the Deerfield River from the town of Florida to the city of North Adams. With only pickaxes and rudimentary black powder available, the pursuit was tough and a notable number of lives were lost to both tunnel collapses and a lack of ventilation. Almost 14 years after the commencement of the project, after the advent of nitroglycerine, the workers were finally able to make real headway through the unrelenting barriers of rock and clay. But this new technology did not come without a price, and it was not long after it was adopted that the first fatal accident occurred. The Origins On the afternoon of the 20th of March 1866, a three-man crew were experimenting with the new explosive at the head of the tunnel works. Ringo Kelly, a tunnel worker, accidentally detonated the explosive charge before his two colleagues, Ned Brinkman and Billy Nash, had made it back to the safety of their operations bunker. The two men were killed instantly, crushed to death by the falling rocks and debris. Following the tragic accident, Kelly became isolated and withdrawn. He was skittish and nervous around his colleagues, claiming to see inexplicable figures following him through the confines of the tunnel. Soon afterwards, he mysteriously disappeared, following which his lifeless body was found, at the exact location where Brinkman and Nash had succumbed to the weight of the avalanche of rocks. Although the local sheriff concluded that he had been strangled by one of his colleagues, in revenge for his two deaths, no one was officially questioned about the murder. Eventually, the rest of the workers also began encountering shadowy figures, moving just beyond the reach of their lantern lights. Sometimes these inexplicable figures allegedly groaned in pain, whilst on others they deafeningly shrieked in terror. Word soon spread that the ghosts of the two men now inhabited the tunnel, and it caused a large number of miners to leave the site for good. With the massive walkout notably affecting the progression of the project, managers began to seek assistance from local clergymen and scholars in an effort to stop the ghost stories. In 1868, the management asked Paul Travers, a qualified mechanical engineer and a respected cavalry officer, to come and inspect the site, hoping that the rumours could be finally dispelled. Rather than agreeing with the construction company's theory that the noises were caused by the wind blowing through the tunnel network, the engineer instead sided with the ghostly claims of the workers. He claimed that during his visit, he had been bombarded with the chilling sounds of the dead and the dying, terrifying repercussions he had not experienced since the Battle of Shiloh. A tragic explosion. A month after Travis's tunnel inspection had taken place, there was a humongous explosion in the pumping station of the tunnel, following an unexpected build-up of naphtha gas. The 13 subcontractors who had been labouring in the tunnel at the time were all caught in the blast. Most of them instantly succumbed to the huge sections of the burning wreckage, but as it would transpire, they would turn out to be the lucky ones. The few survivors quickly understood that there was no way back up and found themselves being pushed deeper and deeper into the depths of the tunnel network by an unending wave of muddy water. Those that did not drown survived a little longer by clinging onto a makeshift floater, but with the tunnel's air pumps destroyed in the explosion, they eventually suffocated. Mallory, a tunnel worker, volunteered to be lowered down into the shaft's bottom through a bucket, hoping to retrieve at least some of his fallen colleagues. When he was pulled back up several minutes later, he was barely conscious. Still falling short of breath, he told his managers there were no survivors to be seen, and all the bodies were gone. It took several months to drain the site, and during that period, at least some of the bloated corpses had found their way out of the flooded tunnel and into the surrounding waterways. The emergence of shadowy figures. Local residents began contacting the police, claiming that mysterious shadowy figures guided them to the remains of the victims, allegedly disappearing when each body was found. One worker claimed to see a group of men with pickaxes on their shoulders, 
walked towards a nearby water-filled pit. As the men had not replied to his calls, the worker had followed them for a short distance before they suddenly vanished near a slushy pit, leaving behind no traces in the wet mud beneath them. The worker observed a dark shape floating in the middle of the pit, following which deafening screams of torment broke the silence around him. As the high-pitched cries continued, the man covered his ears and brought his lantern close to the object in the water. The dim light revealed the bloody remains of a young labourer, one of the victims of the tunnel explosion. Strangely, the screaming stopped instantly after the worker realised what the object in the pit was. When all 13 bodies of the dead workers were recovered and given a proper burial, reports of shadowy figures disappeared along with them. However, sounds of disembodied voices in the dark depths of the facility continued, thus prompting the administration to take further steps to rationalise the happenings. Inexplicable transforming orbs of light. On the evening of the 25th of June, 1874, Superintendent James R. McKinstry, the drilling operations manager, arrived at the tunnel and he had enlisted the services of Dr. Clifford J. Owens, a university lecturer. After James unlocked the gates to the building works, the two men descended into the bowels of the tunnel. Before they had travelled too long, a terrifying commotion that floated from the dark depths halted them. It sounded like a human being in great pain, and it emanated from a dim light that steadily made its way towards the two men. When the light drew near, Owens could see that it was unnaturally blue in colour, unlike anything he had ever witnessed before. As it neared them, it suddenly seemed to change in shape, transforming into a humanoid figure with an empty space instead of a head. The two men found themselves holding their breath in fear, as the shape came to a halt right in front of them. It was hovering a few feet above the ground and seemed to be silently looking at them. For a few moments, the men were surrounded by an eerie silence before the inexplicable figure gave out a high-pitched shriek to break it. Soon afterwards, the figure retreated back into the dark depths. Frank Webster's Encounter Three months after Dr. Owen's experience, a local hunter named Frank Webster disappeared in the woods near the construction site. Three days later, he was found in a disorientated state on the banks of the Deerfield River. When questioned, he claimed that he had been hunting deer in the forest when he heard someone calling to him. The voices led him through the trees and into a nearby ish fissure in the mountain rock. In the poorly lit cave, he had seen shadowy figures working on the rock around him. Strangely, not even their axes hitting the rock made a sound, and the cave remained completely silent. Furthermore, the figures did not respond to Frank's calls. Soon afterwards, an invisible force snatched his hunting rifle from this hold, and it had repeatedly beaten him with it until he blacked out. To accredit his claims, Frank did not have his rifle with him when he was rescued, and he was covered in bruises and abrasions, suggesting a violent assault. The Disappearance of Harlan Mulvaney The first train successfully passed through the Hoosac Tunnel on the 9th of February 1875. The project had taken over 25 years to complete, costing millions of dollars and well over a hundred lives. The opening of the railway line reduced the number of reports of disembodied voices emanating from the walls of the inside of the tunnel, but reports of unearthly orbs of light emerging from the depths of the tunnel still persisted in magnitude. To further worsen the phenomena, other unsettling happenings commenced. In the middle months of 1875, Harlan Mulvaney, an employee of the Boston and Maine Railway Company, was delivering a load of timber to the tunnel in order to replace the damaged wooden supports. Members of the maintenance team had been waiting for him at the entrance and had allegedly waved at him as he passed. As they lit their lanterns and gathered their tools to follow him, Harlan's wagon recklessly bolted past them back out of the tunnel. As the horses pulling it kicked wildly as they ran, Harlan stood upright in his seat with his face depicting an extreme sense of terror. A few days later, a local hunter located the wagon and the horses standing unattended in a forest clearing three miles away from the tunnel entrance. The limber lay undisturbed and Harlan's coat and pipe sat on a seat, but there was no sign of Harlan himself. Sadly, 
Harlan Mulvaney was never seen again. The Disappearance of Bernard Hastaber During the 1970s, stories of the haunting of the Hoosac Tunnel were published in a national newspaper, thus generating a renewed wave of public interest. Paranormal investigators and researchers gathered at the site in large numbers, hoping to collect some form of evidence to prove the existence of the paranormal phenomena. One such individual was a man named Bernard Hastaber, who announced in 1973 that he would walk the full length of the tunnel to disprove the alleged paranormal happenings in the tunnel. With a group of onlookers watching him, Bernard entered the tunnel through the North Adams End, only to be never seen again. The following day, a rescue team retraced his tracks, hoping to find Bernard alive. However, they found no evidence suggesting that he had made his way into the tunnel. It seemingly appeared as if he had vanished into thin air. Accounts of Paranormal Investigators In 1976, an investigator claimed to have seen the spectre of an old man. Dressed in a miner's uniform, the man was apparently backlit by a bright white light. When the investigator confronted the ghostly figure, it had walked directly into a rock face before disappearing. Another investigator named Ali Ormaker claimed to have encountered a paranormal presence while venturing into the tunnel. A shadowy figure had allegedly appeared right next to her before mysteriously disappearing moments later. Furthermore, she claimed to have recorded the muffled sounds of groaning and crying on a tape recorder, but they were never officially verified. Apparently benevolent apparitions. Joseph Impico, a railroad employee, claimed that his life was saved by the tunnel ghosts on two distinct occasions. One evening, Joseph had been removing ice from the rail lines on a blind curve near the tunnel's north entrance, when a male voice suddenly whispered, Run, Joe, run, in his ears. He apparently stopped what he was doing and looked around, but he found no one. Moments later, feeling a violent push on his chest, Joseph fell backwards away from the tracks. Quickly afterwards, a train had come steaming around the corner at an unexpectedly high speed. Without the warning and the subsequent push, Joseph claimed that he could have been killed by the oncoming locomotive. Six weeks later, Joseph experienced something similar. This time, he had been trying to free up the frozen wheels of freight cars when the same voice had whispered, Joe, drop it, Joe, in his ears. Instinctively, Joseph had let go of the metal crowbar he was holding, following which it was immediately thrown against the walls of the tunnel by over 11,000 volts of electricity. A power line had short-circuited and fallen onto the tracks nearby, and the benevolent apparition had saved Joseph's life once again. Conclusion the sheer number of human lives the tunnel had used for its foundations had earned it a frightening nickname, the Bloody Pit. Despite its haunting nature, were its workers really attacked and terrorised by the souls of their dead co-workers? Is there a possible rational explanation? The claustrophobic darkness of the underground tunnel and the notable lack of oxygen could have played tricks in the minds of those labouring in the tunnel. The terrifying environment could have caused them to misinterpret something benign as far more sinister. However, the unsolved deaths and disappearances that occurred at the site do raise questions with no conclusive answer. Perhaps the souls of the dead miners are still trying to find a way to exit the earthly realm. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. Throughout the 19th century, the 50 Berkeley Square house had claimed the life of at least four of its inhabitants, along with a number of other lives that had not been officially verified. Stories of terrifying apparitions, occult rituals and demonic entities surrounding the house had populated the pages of London's newspapers for a good deal of time, thus dubbing it the most haunted house in London. History the property by itself was nothing but ordinary, until the tragic death of Adeline, a resident of the property, in 1789. The young lady was found dead on the pavement outside the house. It appeared as if she had fallen from the second floor bedroom window, during her attempts to escape the abuses of her tyrannical uncle. 
Soon afterwards, the local police began receiving reports of a female figure that desperately held onto the same window ledge before screaming and magically disappearing. Succeeding residents reported seeing the silhouette of a female figure walking in the corridors of the house. Also, they reported encountering the ghost of a young girl who had apparently been murdered by her nanny. Furthermore, furniture reportedly moved on its own and a strange stench allegedly infected the air within the house. George Canning, a former Prime Minister, purchased the house in 1800 and during his stay on the property, he frequently heard loud bangs and inexplicable sounds. Following his death in 1827, the house was rented out by Elizabeth Curzon. Soon afterwards, bizarre rumours about Thomas Myers, one of her lodgers, spread across the country. The dysfunctional son of a Tory MP, Thomas, had moved into the property with his fiancée, who would go on to jilt him at the altar. Following the traumatising event, Thomas became reclusive. He took to sleeping in the daytime and was only glimpsed moving around by candlelight during the hours of darkness. He was often heard making eerily strange noises and rumours about him, using the cellar to dabble in the occult in order to win back his ex-fiancée, began spreading. The cellar features as a backdrop in the story of another lodger named Dupre. It is believed that his mentally unstable brother was imprisoned in the cellar of the house instead of being institutionalised. He was apparently being fed through a small hole in the cellar door until his death. As disturbing as these ghostly tales are, they're insignificant compared to the property's most horrifying uninvited guest, an inexplicable entity that was fondly called the nameless thing of Berkeley Square. Robert Warboys' encounter. The first incident accredited to the terrifying entity occurred in the year 1840. Robert Warboys, a 20 year student, was drinking at a tavern in the neighbouring town of Holborn before discussions about the 50 Berkeley Square house commenced. Intrigued by the tales of the infamously haunted house, drunk Robert subsequently arrived at the doorstep of the house, demanding to spend the night inside. Through persistence and money, he was able to overcome the landlord's denials. However, he was only permitted to sleep in the second floor bedroom under two strict conditions. Firstly, he was supposed to remain armed during the entirety of his stay with a pistol that was entrusted to him. Secondly, he was supposed to pull a cord hanging beside the bed if he witnessed anything unusual. This would, in turn, facilitate assistance. Accepting the terms, he headed into the upper floor of the house and settled in for the night. Just an hour later, the quietness of the house was disturbed by the distraught ringing of the bell, which was soon followed by the loud sound of a gunshot. The landlord immediately sprinted up the stairs, where he found Robert in an unintelligible state. He was backed into a corner, with the empty pistol still raised in his self-defence. Apart from a hole made in a nearby wall by the fired pistol, the landlord couldn't find anything else inside the room. Despite repeated efforts, Robert was not able to explain what he had witnessed inside the house and he fled the house soon afterwards. Lord George Littleton Encounter In the year 1872, 30 years after Robert Warboys' encounter, Lord George Littleton decided to spend a night in the house and he brought his own gun with him as a precaution. A former MP, a member of the Privy Council and an accomplished writer with an obsession for the paranormal, he had confessed his desire to explain the odd happenings in the 50 Berkeley Square house. Littleton was allowed to stay in the same room that Robert had occupied many years before, and with his hunting rifle by his side, he settled in for the night. The outlandish character was soon woken up from his slumber by a strange noise and he quickly reached for his weapon. Exiting the bed, he searched for the source of the sound, eventually tracing it to a dark corner beside the bedroom window. Then, the sound suddenly stopped before a disgusting mass of tentacles jumped to him from the darkened zone. Making a strange sound, the creature rushed towards him, causing him to fire his gun. Blinded by the flash from the rifle's barrel, he immediately retreated and reloaded. However, this proved to be of no use, as the creature had already disappeared, leaving behind a slimy residue. The First Fatal Encounter 
six years later, the house was purchased by a new owner, a woman with two teenage daughters. The family employed a local girl as their maid, and they eventually agreed to allow her fiancé, a naval captain named Kentfield, to move in with her. Soon afterwards, the excited maid headed to the second floor bedroom to prepare it for her and her future husband. Unbeknownst to the poor girl, she was heading towards her untimely death. A few moments later, the house was filled with the distraught screams of the maid. When the inhabitants rushed upstairs, they found her in an incomprehensible state. Her eyes were fixed on one corner of the house and she kept saying, don't let it touch me, repeatedly. With the family not able to calm her down, she was admitted to a local sanatorium. Determined to know the cause behind his fiancé's trauma, Kenfield resolved to spend that night in the same bedroom with his pistol for protection. As the anguished residents desperately tried to fall asleep, they heard a shout of terror from the second floor bedroom, which was followed by the sound of a single gunshot. When they hastily sprinted to the bedroom, they found Kenfield lying dead in a puddle of his own blood. Coincidentally, the maid had also met her demise that same night. Tragic demise of a wandering sailor. A few years later, in December of 1887, HMS Penelope arrived in Portsmouth for refitting. The crew were given leave, and a majority of the sailors headed towards London for the festive season. Among those sailors were Robert Martin and Edward Blunden, two enlisted men who couldn't find themselves a place to stay that night. Their pursuit for shelter took them to the 50 Berkeley Square house, which was now abandoned and vacant. Having broken in, the two sailors decided to spend the night on the second floor, as the lower levels were in an inhabitable condition. They settled down, and assisted by the alcohol in their system, they soon fell asleep. At some point in the night, Edward suddenly woke due to an alleged commotion in the room. When he opened his eyes, he saw a shapeless form making its way across the floor towards Martin. The creature made a strange squelching noise and it left behind a trail of slime behind it. The eyes of the petrified sailor helplessly darted from side to side, searching for a makeshift weapon. He finally spotted a steel poker on the floor, but it was lying just beyond his reach. He jumped towards the rusty tool in a heartbeat and frantically waved it with hopes of scaring the uninvited guest. The creature, however, dodged the waving poker and lunged for Edward's face. The terror-driven screams of Edward woke Martin from his sleep. In the ambience from the outside streetlights, he saw a terrifying mass of tentacles tighten around his crewmate's throat. The sailor abandoned his struggling friend and fled the building in terror. Rather sooner than later, he encountered a patrolling police constable a few streets away. When the two men returned to the abandoned house, they found Edward's lifeless body lying outside the front door. Martin was arrested and interviewed by police, but he was ultimately released without any charges. Theories. The paranormal activity in the house slowly reduced after this incident, and eventually it was sold to the British Petroleum Company and then to an antique book dealership. While the current owners have confirmed that strange bangs and odd noises could still be heard, there have been no visual sightings of ghosts or cryptids. So, what was the malevolent force that stalked this seemingly ordinary townhouse for a century? Although there's no conclusive answer, several theories have surfaced over time. A sceptical point of view. The logical reasoning provided by sceptics was that there was barely anything supernatural taking place at the house. The paranormal elements could have been included in the recounting of the incidents as a cover-up. Robert Warboys, the drunken young man, could have added paranormal elements to his narration in order to avoid losing an alleged bet. Lord George Littleton could have possibly pulled off a publicity stunt in order to sell more of his books. The sailors could have apparently got into a fight that ended badly. To cover the mishap, the surviving sailor could have added supernatural elements to the story. Furthermore, skeptics suggested that many of the events were fabricated, to begin with. With the house becoming a frightening ruin over time, the creepiness it emitted could have caused the concoction of horrifying stories. Even if not an intentional falsehood, the established stories surrounding the house 
could have had a surely negative effect on those who inhabited it. This could have caused them to search for a paranormal explanation for a perfectly normal occurrence. However, the descriptions of the nocturnal attacker detailed in the accounts of the survivors are remarkably similar, despite their encounters occurring many years apart. This factor cannot be logically reasoned, thus making this theory inconclusive. Also, the fact that people from different levels of the social hierarchy were involved in the incidents questions the possibility of collusion or deceit. A demonic portal. One idea put forward by the media was that the terrible activities performed by Thomas Myers and Dupree could have opened a portal in the cellar of the house that allowed demonic entities to enter our world. Although a far stretch, the idea became highly publicised. An unknown cryptid. Another theory put forth by the reporters and investigators of that time offered the possibility of the involvement of an unknown cryptid or an undiscovered variety of cephalopods. The creature could have arrived in the city through one of the many boats travelling on the River Thames. It could have been performed after exposure to chemicals in its new surroundings, or it could have been naturally grotesque in appearance. The creature might have eventually reached the house through the sewage systems before making it his home. Seeing the residents of the house as a threat, it could have aggressively protected its territory. Conclusion The incidents at the house were so unnerving that the local police placed a sign within the household forbidding anybody from the owners from accessing the top two floors. Given that the only credible evidence available is the testimony of those involved, it's hard to conclusively theorise what could have happened. Whatever the possibility, there's no denying the fact that the walls of the house had seen great anguish, pain and suffering. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. This happened about 13 or 14 years ago in my home country, Dominican Republic. I'm 30 now, so it was a while ago, but I've never been able to get it out of my head. It was spring break, and a group of friends and I went up to one of my friend's dad's house in the mountains. This is a town called Costanza, and it's the highest settlement in the country, sitting at 1,200 metres. The house is a bit higher up, as it's located roughly 45 minutes from town, going straight up a mountain. It's the highest house in the area. It was around five or six of us, and we've been hanging out for a few days up there, just having fun, barbecuing, playing pool, and having a few beers. On the third or fourth day, we were all tired since we spent the day walking and horse riding. At around 10pm, everyone was out cold except for my friend and I. We'd been pals for a while and had been there before a handful of times. We always used to stay up late and hang around on the terrace and deck, talking about random stuff. We had already been out there for a while on these reclining patio chairs, and we were looking at the sky and literally counting shooting stars. They're so common up there, it became a sort of game for us. Suddenly, a huge white circular light appeared in the sky. I really don't know how to describe the size, but I want to say it looked like 15 or 20 times the size of a regular star or a faraway airplane light. It didn't appear to be close. In fact, it looked like it was very far away. The light just sat there, completely still. We asked each other if we were seeing the same thing, but didn't talk much after... It felt entrancing, and we both fell silent, looking at it for about a minute. Out of nowhere, this light just starts bouncing around the sky at an incredible speed, over a huge distance in the sky. The best way I can describe it is it moved like the ball in Pong inside what looked like a defined area, like a square or rectangle. This bouncing around went on for 30 seconds or so, and then it just disappeared. No trace of the light whatsoever. Nothing. Now here's the weirdest part. We immediately felt sleepy. We were actually dozing off in a matter of seconds. I don't remember who said we should go to sleep, or if any of us actually said it, but we stood up and went to our rooms. That night, I had the most vivid and realistic dream I've ever had, and that's what keeps me awake at night. I remember being on a spaceship moving on top of a river. I never felt scared or in danger. I never saw anyone or anything else but I felt a presence there with me. 
I was standing in the front part of the ship, in front of a huge window just looking out. We were moving slowly on top of this river, floating or flying. And it looked like the river was coming to an end, like a waterfall. When we reached the end, we kept flying, and I could see this amazing view. Just tons of waterfalls, and each had structures built on the rivers. It looked like a futuristic city built on these rivers and the surrounding lands. It was truly amazing. I didn't see much else, but one of the most bizarre things is that I heard or felt numbers. It was a long sequence, which I think were coordinates or something similar that they were trying to tell me. I woke up and I still remembered those numbers, similar to when you wake up and remember a dream very vividly, but forget almost instantly. I stood up dazed and confused and went looking for something to write, but I forgot them before I could do anything. A lot of years have gone by and I'm still convinced these beings were trying to tell me where they are. I'm not sure where they need to tell us where they are or why they chose me, but I really believe it. I've never had any other paranormal ghost or abductions or otherworldly experiences, so this one has really stuck with me over the years. I just wanted to share my experience and hopefully find others who have had similar ones. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. This year I've experienced two events that I initially thought were sleep paralysis or night terrors, but now suspect they may have been shadowing people after doing some research. Both times my name was spoken beforehand. My boyfriend recently had a similar unsettling experience as well. How can you tell the difference? The first time I encountered them was in a hotel room on a work trip. While sleeping, I was woken to the audible sound of someone whispering my name directly in my ear. I opened my eyes and saw a black shadow figure standing near the end of the bed by the wall. Next to him was a white shadow figure who gave me the impression of being a woman. I tried to say, who are you? But I couldn't speak or move my body. The figure started walking as if to approach me, but I got the sense that the white shadow was trying to block the black shadow. I suddenly regained my voice and yelled, Who are you? in an effort to appear strong and scare them away. The figures dissipated. I played it off as a bad dream mixed with mistaking the figures for reflections of objects in the mirror they stood by. I was really shaken and genuinely afraid, and it made me, took me a while to fall back asleep. The second encounter was last week. I was having nightmares all night, but then was again woken to the distinct audible sound of someone whispering my name in my ear. I opened my eyes and saw a child-sized black shadow figure right next to my bed staring at me. He seemed to have a faint white outline to his silhouette. Again, I was frightened by this and pulled the covers over my head like a little kid. He was gone when I looked again. Am I having night terrors, or is there something more to this? My boyfriend once saw a shadow figure at the end of his bed when he was a child. Then a few months ago, he woke me up in the middle of the night yelling at something and leaning over me looking at the wall. I asked him what was wrong, and he said he was dreaming that a group of freaky shadow figures were crawling on the wall towards me, and he was trying to protect me by covering me. The dream ended as soon as he yelled at them. I understand people believe these shadow figures feed off negative emotions. This has been a rough year for me, to say the least. So I'm trying to determine if these are just stress-induced nightmares, or entities feeding off my energy. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. I believe I met my boyfriend twice a few years ago. When I was 19, I still lived with my parents. My best friend and my boyfriend lived in the same town an hour away, but in different areas. My best friend invited me over to spend the night, so I did. I always slept on the couch in the living room, in a little apartment. My best friend always made sure to lock the doors and windows, because her neighbourhood wasn't the most safe. I would usually double check too, because I slept by the front door. Around two in the morning, I woke up to use the bathroom. I got up, went about my business, and when I came out, my boyfriend was standing in the living room. He was working the night shift at the time and would usually take his break at 2am, but I was shocked at how he even got into the apartment because I knew the door was locked. He brought me a vape because I asked him early that day. 
We talked for a bit, then he seemed a bit off. It was like he was looking through me. I ended up laying back down because he said he had to go back to work. He leaned down and kissed me, but right before leaving, he turned to me and said, tell her to get some more locks. It was way too easy to break into here. Then he left. I woke up in the morning and told my friend what had happened. And yes, the door was unlocked because I forgot to lock it again. Later that day, when my boyfriend woke me up, he came over. I thanked him for bringing me the rape again, and he looked so confused. He told me he had never left work that night, and still to this day, three years later, denies that he ever left work, and I believe him. So my friend went and bought a new lock for the door. Turns out, about two weeks after this all happened, some of the apartments were robbed. Butchers weren't. Maybe it's because the double warned her to get another lock. This still creeps me out so badly to this day. How did the double know to bring me a vape? Didn't know that the apartments would get robbed? And was it trying to warn my friend? I thought doubles were supposed to be evil. Why was this one good? You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. I'd like to ask for help after a very recent possible encounter with possible explanations as to what I've encountered or what I should do after this. A short background. I'm a work at home technical specialist. I work nights for 12 hours and sleep in the morning. Today's my day off and I usually spend my time gaming or just napping my days away until the next shift. So basically I can say I'm always tired, mostly mentally and emotionally as it's mostly just working on a computer. I always have this certain amount of belief in the paranormal. Like, I believe that ghosts or anything remotely spiritual are true. But I've never encountered anything as of the date, and I would like to verify if what I saw was true. I wrote the short background before this to give the benefit of the doubt that I may have been really tired today and I've been seeing things. But then again, I'm keeping an open mind and nevertheless, the whole, my whole world was shaken as I've never seen anything like this before. So after hours of gaming, I went to my room to take a nap. Note that my parents and sister are outside the room watching Netflix. I dozed off after a few minutes, my mind wandering on the lines of what I should do for tomorrow, for my oncoming shift, and some random stuff like my lost love etc. I think I dozed off for a few hours and then suddenly, when I opened my eyes, it was there. It was a tall figure, like a man but made out of smoke. I can vaguely remember the eyes, but there were just white eye holes in its face. I'm pretty sure it noticed that I saw it, as it seemed surprised. What I felt was pure fear, a fight or flight response as I felt an intent that it was going to hurt me. The apparition suddenly raised both of its arms, and it looked like it was preparing some sort of an attack. I believe that after years of martial arts experience, my first reaction was to quickly rise from my bed and dash towards it screaming. Note again that if I didn't do it thinking, my fear urged me to lunge towards its torso and I bumped against the door. My family heard both screaming and the large bang as I hurriedly opened the door and dived towards my family. I was crying and shaking for real and was screaming for them while I hugged my sister tight. My family is Catholic, and after I told them that I saw a ghost, they went and grabbed holy water and sprayed it towards my room to make it go away. After a few hours of recuperating, I explained it to my family, and we couldn't explain what that thing was that I saw, and maybe tried to hurt me. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. It started about six months ago. I remember waking up from a deep sleep to see what looked like the shadowy image of a cat crawling up my leg towards my face. Not thinking anything of it, I absent-mindedly moved my hand to shoo it away, thinking it might have been my current pet. As soon as my hand made contact with it, all I remember is this immense electrical pain running through my whole body. I couldn't think, move, or even breathe. Eventually, the pain stopped and I fell asleep once more. At first, I thought maybe I had my first sleep paralysis experience, and for about three months after that, nothing else happened, until I started seeing it again. 
it began to become so frequent that I avoided my room entirely, much to my wife's annoyance. Eventually, she decided to do some cleaning and remove some items from our room. Among them was a very special item to me, which may have been the cause of all this. I'll explain below. I had to move out of the state to get married, and in that time, my Russian blue cat Sadie had to be put down because of a cancer that got very aggressive. Because I couldn't be there, my parents imprinted her paws into a clay disc and sent it to me. I've held on to it ever since. Soon, I started seeing the creature in the storage room that my wife had moved the disc into. I thought it was a weird occurrence, so I decided to move it into another room, and sure enough, the creature started appearing there too. Now, I'm not sure if this is the spirit of my past friend, but to come back seven years later is weird. What do you guys think? Could it be her? Could it be a spirit pretending to be her? You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. This was back in 2015 or 16. I lived with my parents in an apartment. Our front door faced another set of apartment buildings with a small pond in between. It was a weekday. I was leaving for school early one morning for an extracurricular class I had before classes. I left the apartment. It was still mostly dark outside. I had gone all the way downstairs into my car when I realised I left something behind inside. I locked my car back up and started up the stairs. I made it to the second set of stairs and was facing the pond and neighbouring apartments when I saw a figure on someone's back porch. It was hard to make out details, but I saw the outline of a person in a suit standing motionless on one of the porches. I couldn't make out a face or even flesh, just a black suit on a body. I kept staring and didn't see it move. It was maybe a month or so after Halloween, so as I jogged up the rest of the stairs, my brain told me it was someone's Halloween decoration. I made it up to the third floor where I lived and entered. Grabbing whatever I needed, I rushed in and quickly backed out, locking the door behind me. Again at this point, I'm facing the apartment building next door. What I see then is the same figure still standing without moving, but there was something new. Another one. Same suit on a body, but sitting in a chair on a completely different porch. Same as the first one, I couldn't make out any facial details. I don't think I looked for long. I rushed down the stairs into my car. I gave myself a minute to think, which caused me to panic. Why would two neighbours have a Halloween decoration still out that I had never noticed before, well after the holiday? If they were real people, why didn't I see them move? And why were two men in suits on back porches before the sun was up? I didn't know what men in black were at this point, so when I found out, it made me feel sick. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before or since. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. I was in the Virginia, Maryland area and had a lot of work-related sites ranging from downtown Baltimore to Virginia Beach and all around. Friday wrapped up, and I hit the road to some social arrangements I had made for the weekend. Spent the weekend with friends out in various parts of Virginia, got dragged off to other places even further out, the usual weekend fun times. It's late Saturday night when I have to leave, or I'm going to be late to get home in time to start my Monday. I'm fully rested, I didn't do any drinking, I'm not into drugs. On the highway at about 3am, in the middle of bumfuck nowhere between Ronaco and DC, absolutely nobody was around. I'm cruising along near the left lane simply because nobody else is around. No headlights for the past hour, no tail lights either. No road lamps either. It's dark, mildly damp and foggy. I have the music up, I'm feeling good, and all is fine. And then I just happen to look to the left and there's a fucking dog barking at me. A German shepherd in a car passenger seat, somewhat blue glow from the instruments inside the car. And it's got its face to its window and it's barking its head off at me. I get a good hard look at it too, because at first my brain is not registering cop car dummy. I'm doing 90 plus in a 75. I promptly have the oh shit moment when the dog, the instruments, 
the white crown Vic light bar all click in my brain after a second hard look. I put my foot on the brakes and started slowing down hard but safely to pull over. I even put my blinker on to start shifting lanes over to the right to pull over because, wait, there is no shoulder on the left side of this road. I look back to my left and it's just gone. No trace. I slammed my brakes and stopped in the middle of the fucking highway, flipped on all my light bars and even looked around with my handheld spot. There was nothing. No tail lights, no headlights, no engine sounds, nothing. There were no other tyre marks in the damp but mine, and I can see for a nice long distance both ways too. Nothing. My vehicle had great visibility with a lot of extra lighting. There's no possible way somebody pulled a sneaky, let alone drove that fast on wet sloped grass and rocks on my left side. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. This happened around 2021. I can't remember the month, but I'd say mid to late 2021. My partner and I live in Australia. At the time, we were renting my partner's grandparents' home from them, as they were both put into elderly homes, because they were unable to care for themselves. My partner was working as an enrolled nurse at the time, and usually got back around 7pm every night. I, however, did night shifts at a fuel station, but had the night off. Now here was the structure of the lounge room layout. The room was rectangle, and the north side was all windows, which looked out at the front patio area, which you would have to walk up the driveway and directly past the front window to reach the front door. Once you walked in the front door, you would then turn right to enter the lounge, where I currently was. So basically, you couldn't be seen coming up to the front door if someone was in the lounge room, as the sofas were along the south side of the room, facing the windows. I was watching Dragon Ball Super in the lounge room at around 6.15pm. I had the lights off and could see out the front through the gap in the curtains. It was still kind of light outside at that time. That's when I heard the distinct sound of my partner's feet walking up the gravel driveway opening the gate and beginning to walk past the front window. I remember thinking, wow, she must have got a early tonight. Anyways, I saw her walk past the front window through the gap in the curtain. But after about one minute of no noise, I began to wonder why she wasn't coming in the front door. It was as if she was standing at the front door doing nothing. So I got up and wandered up to the curtain to peek out at the door to see what she was doing. And to my surprise, she wasn't there. As I was pondering what just happened, I heard footsteps walking down the driveway, and to my bewilderment, it was her. I said to her when she came in, Did you forget something in your car? She replied, No, I got a fairly tonight. Why? I didn't say anything. There's more to this, but this was the first thing to happen, and the creepiest. About five years ago, I was asleep in bed with my then boyfriend. It was summer and hot as ever, so I was sleeping naked with no blankets. At about 1am, I woke up to the distinct feeling of someone smacking my butt. Hard. Not only did the feeling of it wake me up, but the loud smack sounded too. I was absolutely distraught. I've had many paranormal experiences, but nothing ever physical, and was completely caught off guard and terrified. My boyfriend searched around the room for some logical explanation, while I sobbed and tried to explain what happened, but he couldn't find anything to explain it. He had also been woken up by the loud smack. Once I calmed down enough, we went back to sleep with the lights on. Shortly after falling asleep, I woke up lying on my side in full sleep paralysis episode. I couldn't move or speak and could hear a man's voice laughing behind me. This went on for a bit as I tried to scream or move and finally was able to roll over and saw nothing. I didn't go back to sleep that night. The next day, I called my grandmother, who was a medium, and asked her if she could sense anything in my home. I told her nothing about my experience from the night before. She told me there was a man in my house who would sit in the living room and wait for me to come home. She said he was mostly harmless, but enjoyed seeing me scared and would get a good laugh out of frightening me. A couple of days later, I worked up the courage to yell into my empty house that he wasn't welcome and had to leave and wasn't all there to scare me anymore. I had no more experiences with him after that. 
You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. I'm hunting for information on a cryptid. I'm not even sure it's been marked down yet. There have been multiple sightings in my small town of Merrill, Michigan. Something of which doesn't match a single cryptid I've read about yet. And I've read a lot. I personally haven't seen it, so I'm sorry for breaking that rule. But I have three witnesses that I would put my life on, and I really want to know about this thing. The first witness is my uncle, and he's the main reason I'm on this hunt. When he was young, he used to take night walks in the neighbor's woods. Right before sunrise, as long as it was dark enough so no neighbors could see him, he would take a very dim flashlight with him on purpose, and if he thought anyone saw him or was following him, he'd put his hand over it and hide in the woods darkness. He claims the main things that scared him were the raccoons and opossums. He never had problems with people on his walks, but he still knew the risk of trespassing. Though his story isn't very exciting, he got the best view on the creature out of all three witnesses, claiming that it only stood a few feet tall, had legs bent backwards with large fly-like eyes, and the rest of it looked like a kangaroo and a monkey hybrid. There are many cryptids that are close in visuals, but none of them have thick hair and big eyes like this one had. I showed him drawings of other look-alike cryptids and he dismissed every one of them. He claimed that he was walking out of the woods just as it was getting brighter. The sky was grey and the woods still dark from the trees, but the road was almost visible down the whole mile. On his way across the road back to the house, he saw that thing a little ways down the road. It's said to have crossed the road in two steps, despite being short, and disappearing into the woods my uncle had just exited. The second witness is deceased now. He was a natural conspiracist, so it came as no surprise when I heard this story years ago. Though his description was much less valuable, I have the belief that it was the same cryptid. A couple miles away from the first incident, the man said he saw a small, ape-like figure jump almost to the tops of the trees. This is the least resourceful sighting, because I cannot ask this man to answer anything he left out, or give more info. This is all I have for his sighting. The third is my grandma's good friend, Sylvia from a state away. Every 4th of July, they park a camper in my grandma's yard and stay for a week or two to visit all the friends and family they left behind when they moved out of state. Keep in mind, these folk have never even heard the stories of this creature, and for this story, I was in the house as it happened. Sylvia's husband had a few beers with my grandparents. There's a big tree on the side of a barely used road, and he walked over it to use the bathroom. As he was peeing on this tree, he noticed the same big black bug eyes that my uncle had seen. It was staring him down from the tree line across the road, and as soon as he focused on it, the cryptid backed up into the bush and was gone. Me and my uncle freaked out about this, as you would, because it had been six or so years since someone we knew spotted this thing. As crazy as it sounds, me and my whole family believe and know this creature. We've even narrowed down where it possibly calls home, based on how far sightings go. If you have any idea what might be lurking around mid-Michigan, please leave a name of a cryptic in a description or drawing. My family and I all want to know what so many of us have seen. Any ideas? You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. In 2019, while in college, I live in a split-level home with five other students. There were wooden steps leading up to the front door, and once you entered the door, you find yourself on a landing where you could either go down a flight of stairs to the basement, or up a flight of stairs that led right into our main living area. Even if you missed the sound of a car pulling in, you could always tell when one of us had gotten home, because you could hear them clump their way up the steps to the door. Sometimes I would hear this and just run down the stairs to open the door for them, rather than make them have to get their keys out. The sound of someone getting home was unmistakable. We all knew what it sounded like. It was night time and we were all sitting in this main area when I heard footsteps run up the stairs that led to where we were sitting. We weren't expecting someone and everyone that lived in the house was sitting right there. So we all reacted and were like, what the hell was that? thinking it could have been a ghost, because the house always had a weird vibe anyway. 
like there was always someone lurking right behind you. This is when it goes from normal ghost weird to extra weird. I'm not sure how we realised this, but it almost immediately became clear that we had all heard a different sound, although we all reacted at the same time. Someone heard footsteps run up the outside stairs. Someone else heard someone struggling with the door and handle lock. Someone else heard the door actually open, and I heard feet running up the inside stairs. Essentially, we all heard something enter our house, but we each heard a different part of it. One of my roommates kept going to open the door and check if anyone was there, but my other roommate, who has had the most paranormal experiences out of that group, had the knee-jerk reaction to yell at him, don't let it in. We end up deciding that someone must have tried to trick us into letting it inside. I was recently talking to that friend who shouted about not letting it in, and he reminded me about something that happened a few days later that I had totally forgotten about. I pulled into the driveway, and that friend ripped open the front door to shout down at me that a priest had just been at the door. But no one had answered the door because they didn't know why he was there. I was raised Catholic, and I know that priests don't just show up at your front door for no reason. So I automatically got weirded out and ran down to the chapel that was about a five minute walk from the house, because that was the only place that a priest could be coming from. When I got there, I found someone who worked at the chapel and told them what had happened with the priest knocking on our door. But they looked at me like I had three heads and told me that the priest had been getting ready for mass for a good while. I asked if there was a second priest, maybe making house calls to homes in the area, but they had no clue what I was talking about. I'm not sure if this has any relation at all to what we all heard a few nights before, but if something wanted to get into a house of five people and several of them are Catholics, a priest would be a pretty good disguise. My friend says he wasn't shifting to peer into windows or anything like that. He just stood there and waited and then walked off. Has anyone ever heard of something like this? Where everyone hears something, but it's different for everyone? Or even a non-ghostly explanation? I really just want to understand what the hell happened that night, or if it's super out there to think that the priest might be related. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. So my parents bought this house over 45 years ago. I lived there from about age 2 till about 22. I recently moved back in. In those years, many small things have happened. When I was young, I slept with the door open till I woke up in the middle of the night and watched a shadow walk up the hall, then turn and walk through my parents' bedroom door. No door opening or shutting. I never slept with the door open or a light in the room again. The whole family is on vacation, except I'm home going to school and watching the cat. House has an alarm on it and I set it before bed. I have plans with friends to study, but can't find the keys the next morning. I remember putting them on a very small table next to the garage. They were gone. Look there and the rest of the house over, and that specific table four times. I then start to call my friends that I'm not going to make it, since I can't find the keys. Except now they're right in the middle of the table, nearly on top of the phone. An hour of searching. My only sibling and his wife were staying at the house while the parents were again on vacation. They were sleeping in my parents' bedroom, when all of a sudden, the ensuite bathroom sink turns on and runs for about 45 seconds, then turns off. Dad claims to have heard that sink run in the middle of the night before, when Mom was right beside him in bed, asleep. The house is a three-bedroom house, and my brother had the smallest room next to mine when we were young. But we both always got creeped out by the closet, so I had to move into my room because of it. Sitting in the living room reading a book, when I heard a sort of low rumble, I went into the kitchen to see what was making the noise, and a knife that was on the counter was slowly rotating in circles. It had been making the noise for a good minute before I even got in there, and it kept going for a good 30 more seconds. Nobody has been or was in the kitchen before it happened. The kitchen is open to the living room, so I could see the area from my chair. I have many more, but that certainly gives the gist. 
You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com. So a little context before we get started. My husband and I moved back into my mum's house seven years ago. Her health isn't good and she couldn't handle it all and the house, so we offered to help. This is my childhood home and my family and I have had experienced a lot of things happening and noises etc over the years. Nothing bad, just things going missing and turning up somewhere random. Plates and cups moving around in the kitchen when there's no one in there. You get the picture. Recently, it's been a lot worse. Since October, my youngest daughter, who has never had night terrors before, is having them multiple times a week. My eldest daughter is sleepwalking suddenly, and not just the funny putting weird things in the fridge sleepwalking. I mean walking into a pitch black room in the middle of the night and start screaming, pointing at something and saying things like, I don't like it. I don't like him. I don't want to be here. It's absolutely terrifying when she's going through this for me and for her. This last week, I've heard my mum's voice when she hasn't even been in the house. The first time I was walking past her bedroom and she called my name. So I went in to see if she needed my help and she wasn't there. I called her and she was out shopping. The second time was today actually. I was in my kitchen tidying my eldest daughter's shoelace before we left for school. And my little ran one into our living room. Both my daughter and I heard my mum talking to my other daughter in the living room. I know my eldest heard it too and isn't going along with what I say because at the same time we looked up at each other confused and asked each other if we'd heard her. My mum had already left the house half an hour before this. I even checked the CCTV to see if she came back into the house and was somewhere else in the house. I shouted through to my little one, asking if she was talking to Nana. And she said, no, Nana not here. Both me and my mum keep waking up with scratches on us also. Not little scratches, deep scratches. Basically, I'm looking to see if any of this makes sense to someone or if I'm losing my mind. You are listening to the content of Paranormal.com.